Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2021 Global Youth Summit on Net Zero Future. My name is Catherine and I'm from Tsinghua University. Since 2019, 15 universities have joined together to create the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate in order to promote cooperation and exchange among university members and implement solutions on issues surrounding climate change. Our previous two forums have gathered nearly 400 postgraduates from 50 universities and a joint declaration have been submitted to United Nations General Secretary Antonio Guterres. The Global Youth Voices have also received appraisals from global leaders. Despite the challenges seen since last year, we are fortunate to gather together here on this platform in order to empower the Gen Z to create a better tomorrow. Now, we are very excited to announce our third GAUG Graduate Forum. With the arrival of carbon neutrality, the forum is upgraded to a brand new summit this year, the Global Youth Summit on Net Zero Future, which mobilized global youth power to contribute vigor, insights, and actions. While recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic hit from last year, 2021 offers a strategic opportunity to incorporate COP15 and COP26 together and joining biodiversity and climate change to reach closer goals to the net zero future. To reach these objectives, this year's theme is surrounded by Climate X, which emphasizes the interconnection between climate change and other UN Sustainable Development Goals. The summit will mainly focus on four areas including nature and biodiversity, health and food, energy, and transportation. We are moving on to the first part of our opening ceremony with some special remarks on the reasons why we are gathering here today. I would like to warmly welcome our first speaker, Ms. Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Please welcome. It's a pleasure to welcome you and to participate in the Global Youth Summit. COP26 is now only a few short weeks away and the decisions made in Glasgow will have an impact upon both our short-term and long-term futures. It's the most important COP since the Paris Agreement was adopted and it's essential we achieve success not only with respect to completing outstanding work, but that parties continue to build climate action demanded by billions throughout the world. Your voices are essential, and I specifically thank you for your efforts to achieve a net zero future. It's a goal we must achieve. The science clearly shows the devastation of our current path. Earlier this year, the World Meteorological Organization reported that concentrations of major greenhouse gases continue to increase. The most recent IPCC report stated that unless there are rapid, sustained and large scale reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees will be difficult to achieve. And UN Climate Change's NDC synthesis report showed that despite some progress, more nations, many more, 
need to submit stronger national climate action plans if we're to ultimately achieve that 1.5 degree goal. These reports are needed, yet today we no longer only have reports to tell us what climate change will look like. Some of us merely need to step outside. So many of you have seen flooded streets and rising waters threatening your lives and your communities. You've felt the searing heat. You've heard and smelled burning forests and encroaching wildfires. You know we need action now. We need everyone, governments, businesses, and everyday people to get and stay involved. We must ensure all voices are heard. We call that inclusive multilateralism. We've long championed it at UN Climate Change and will continue to do so. Together, looking at the work ahead, one thing is clear. The road to net zero must first pass through Glasgow and COP26. Let's turn to what we need for success at Glasgow. First, if we are to move ahead with future commitments, whether we're talking about 2050 or otherwise, it's vital past promises are kept. It's how trust works. There are several outstanding commitments, but none stand out more than the pledge by developed nations to mobilize 100 billion to developing nations, a commitment that has been discussed for more than a decade. It's a cornerstone of the Paris Agreement and must be fulfilled if we are to have confidence future commitments will be met. Second, success in Glasgow means fully implementing the Paris Agreement itself. Its adoption was not an end, but a beginning. A blueprint is just a blueprint unless you do something with it. It's time for nations to realize its potential. But that means parties must complete an incredible amount of work to make that happen. And they must do so in several areas. Carbon markets, transparency, capacity building, adaptation, and many more. Third, success means raising ambitions. Countries must commit to do more on all key aspects of the climate agenda mitigation, adaptation, and finance. And as you rightly point out, we need clear plans to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. That doesn't just go for governments. We need all sectors of society, all people, and certainly non-party stakeholders to do their part. That leads me to our last key for success in Glasgow ensuring all voices are heard. Everyone has a role to play and everyone can contribute to collective success. Representation of all regions and groups is crucial. Some may say this is too difficult. We say it's absolutely essential. Like you, our focus is on solution. That's the entire purpose of Action for Climate Empowerment, or ACE. ACE helps governments raise ambition on climate action through public awareness and training. It's about engagement. It's about lifelong learning. It's about empowering people of all ages to act and to drive the transition to a low carbon, just and climate resilient society and it helps them to adapt their skills across all aspects of the economy to current and future challenges. ACE is flexible, which is important. After all, the climate emergency is not static. It will continue to create unprecedented events. We need multiple pathways for people, especially young people, to lead climate action. 
decisions made at COP26, decisions made this year, will determine your future. I urge you to keep up your efforts as we work to make it a future that is not only green and sustainable, but one that is inclusive, just and prosperous in all respects of the term for all people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Espinosa, for your speech. Now let's welcome Special Representative for Climate Change, Mr. Nick Bridge. Hi, I am Nick Bridge, the UK Special Representative for Climate Change, and it's a huge honour to be part of this global alliance of universities for climate in the opening ceremony. Thank you for having me. Um, we are very close to COP26. What are we trying to achieve there? Well, as the uh, co-presidency with Italy, we have three big goals. The first is that when we think about the Paris Agreement, that historic agreement five or six years ago, it got us to all agree to tackle the problem. But the commitments we made set us still on a more than three degrees Celsius trajectory, an absolutely catastrophic trajectory. So at Glasgow at COP26, we are um, trying to show that we can keep that 1.5 degrees Celsius limit to temperature rise within reach. And we are making progress in bending that curve We've brought it down from well over three degrees to around a little over two degrees on the basis of the commitments we've managed to gather in recent months. And we want to show that at Glasgow, we are going to go further and achieve that almost halving of the global emissions by 2030 and the removal of any contribution to climate change by the middle of the century. So bending that curve is the first big thing we must show. Secondly, we have to deliver uh, for the poorest and most vulnerable countries, get the finance and get the technical assistance into places that are already suffering catastrophic impacts, but for whom it is going to get worse and who are least well resourced to cope. So we have to have that big emphasis on adaptation, on resilience and financing the situation uh, in the poorest and most vulnerable countries, which are more than half of the UN membership. And third, we want to show that the real economy is shifting in energy, in transport, in our agricultural systems, that we are transforming the way we live into a more sustainable way uh, that is fairer, less unequal, and that delivers our wider sustainability uh, goals. Climate, environmental degradation, the health impacts that we are currently facing in the world, the economic and financial challenges. We need to pull all this into one place and create a more sustainable future and see how all those issues knit together out there in the real world, in, in society, and have a whole of society, whole of economy approach to COP. It affects everybody and everybody can have a role in supporting this. Get that environmental and climate issue out of that silo and think holistically right across all of your universities. What's the economics of this, the finance of this, the politics of this, the psychology of this, so that we can move forward into a more sustainable future? So let's get behind COP26 and then build on it. So raise that ambition but then do the actions that we need to do to make it real in the world in the years ahead. We have no time to lose. My second general introductory remark is around you as the young people. You are already the most powerful voice, I believe, in this agenda. Make your voice heard in your community, in your family, in your university and, and more widely. But second, you are the future and we need uh, you to be working together, collaborating in that positive spirit, that dynamic spirit. And do not be told this is the way it has to be. Think about a better way and drive that forward. Uh, Buckminster Fuller uh, once said, 
you never change things by fighting the existing reality. You change something by building a new model that makes the existing reality obsolete. So get out there and be encouraged to really lead uh, your communities, your universities in that process. And we wish you all the best. Thank you on behalf of the uh, UK uh, co-presidency of COP26 and good luck. Thank you very much, Mr. Bridge, for his speech. And now let's welcome Mr. Xie Zhenghua, Special Envoy on Climate Change Affairs from China. Welcome. Dear friends, teachers, students, good day. I'm very pleased to be invited by the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate to take part in the third graduate forum of GOG at the opening ceremony of Global Youth Summit on Zero Carbon Future. This is also the third time that I take part in the graduate forum of GOG. I'm very glad to see that in the critical period of global cooperation towards the goal of carbon neutrality, the Alliance upgrades the forum into a summit and unites the power of member universities and partners to provide a platform for global youth to learn from each other, communicate and cooperate, and to mobilize young people around the world to contribute their talents and actions to achieve a zero-carbon future. This is essential for advancing the realization of the carbon neutral goal and accelerating the exploration of sustainable solutions. On September 22, 2020, President Xi Jinping pledged during the 75th UN General Assembly China will scale up its nationally determined contribution by peaking carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and strive to achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. As the world's largest developing country, China will complete the world's highest reduction in carbon emission intensity and achieve the transition from carbon peak to carbon neutrality in the shortest time in global history. This means that China will carry out a wide-ranging and profound economic and social transformation, which requires arduous efforts. China has established a carbon peak and a carbon neutral work leading group and established a carbon peak and a carbon neutral one plus n policy system. China is about to introduce policy measures and actions in key fields such as energy industry, construction and transportation, as well as supporting measures such as the green financial carbon trading market. China will honor its commitments and make new and greater contributions to global climate governance and green recovery. Dear colleagues, teachers and students, at present, the global implementation of the Paris Agreement and the realization of a green and low-carbon transition are irreversible. The global climate governance process of the COVID-19 pandemic still has a long way to go. Driven by countries' response to climate change to achieve green recovery and implementation of related policies and actions, the world will usher in a green and low-carbon energy revolution, technological revolution, and industrial transformation. Youth play an extremely important role in the course of achieving carbon neutrality goals. You are not only contributors to innovative solutions, but also practitioners to achieve the goal of carbon neutrality and the barriers of climate change risks and losses. The participation of more young people in the course of tackling climate change is a key condition for achieving the goal of carbon neutrality and embarking on a long-term sustainable development path. I hope that you will fully understand the new trends, seize the new opportunities, give full play to your own advantages, and actively take the initiative to better realize yourselves in this revolution. At the same time, make your own contributions to help achieving carbon peak and carbon neutral goals. I look forward to your communications and active voices during the summit. Not only can you build up the momentum for the forthcoming United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, but you also can contribute your insights to global climate governance solutions. Finally, I wish this forum a complete success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Xie, for his speech.
And now let's welcome Chair of Gauk and President of Tsinghua, Mr. Chiu Yong. Please welcome. Distinguished guests, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Today, we celebrate the grand opening of the Global Youth Summit on Zero Carbon Future, which is also the third graduate forum of the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate. First of all, on behalf of the Alliance, I'd like to extend my cordial welcome to our distinguished guests, global partners, colleagues, and young students for participating in this summit from all over the world and express my heartfelt gratitude for your long-term support to address the global challenge of climate change. More and more entities represented by countries, regions, cities, private sectors, and universities are taking active actions with youth and the staunch force for achieving a zero carbon future. In light of this circumstance, the Alliance has launched Climate X Global Youth Summit on Net Zero Future, upgraded from the GOC Graduate Forum to emphasize the transforming impact and the close interconnection between climate change and other global issues particularly the UN Sustainable Development Goals. By bringing together our 15 alliance universities and the partners from nine countries across six continents, we will be able to bring more youth into a platform for learning, exchanging, and making their voice heard from a fresh viewpoint on how to achieve a carbon neutral future. The summit, led by Cambridge University and the Imperial College London and co-organized by Columbia University, Yale University, Oxford University, and Tsinghua University, is being prepared forward by more members, including the London School of Economics and Political Science, the University of Tokyo, University of Stellenbosch, India Institute of Science, and the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. I'd like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to all of the member institutions and partners for their contributions to this summit. As a member of the Alliance, Tsinghua University has attached great importance to climate research and education. In December 2017, we established the Institute of Climate Change and Sustainable Development. In May 2019, the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate was officially established. On January 6, 2020, President Xi Jinping sent a letter in reply to the student representatives of the GOC Graduates Forum expressing his appreciation for their concern for the shared future of mankind and his expectations for their active role to protect our common planet. In order to help young students learn about the most cutting-edge climate research, Tsinghua organized a series of lectures on climate change inviting policymakers and field experts around the world to share their insights, attracting more than 2 million students worldwide. Just months ago, Institute for Carbon Neutrality was established in Tsinghua University to integrate our efforts to develop innovative technological solutions to achieve carbon neutrality. On behalf of Tsinghua University, I hereby invite schools inside and outside the Alliance to exchange and cooperate with each other to explore more paths to a carbon neutral future. Dear guests, colleagues, and students, the Alliance will give a well-prepared spiritual feast this week. I hope 
that everyone takes advantage of this exchange and learning opportunity to interact in this, uniting each other, improve together, and empower themselves. Now, the door to carbon neutrality is open. Let us, hand in hand, march towards a zero carbon future together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chiu, for his speech. And now let's welcome Ms. Minush Shafiq, co-chair of GAUK and president of London School of Economics. Please welcome. Welcome to the GAUK Global Youth Summit on Net Zero Future 2021. With COP26 and the United Nations Climate Change Conference taking place in the UK in early November, this summit is an opportunity to build further momentum for greater action, ambition, and impacts in delivering a net zero carbon future for the planet. And young people have been at the forefront of pushing pressure to make that happen. Thank you to all the students who've submitted papers and videos in advance of the summit with ideas and proposals to tackle the climate challenge of our time. This summit is an opportunity to draw attention to the interconnection between climate change and the other UN Sustainable Development Goals and the transforming impact that climate change can have, particularly in areas like food and health, transportation, energy, nature, and biodiversity. It's critically important for younger generations to take on a lead and making their voice heard in this race to zero carbon to protect the future of the planet. And of course, universities prepare the leaders of tomorrow and students have been vocal advocates for urgent action at universities and in their later professional lives. At the London School of Economics, we've taken very seriously our responsibility and duty to take decisive action on climate change to help shape a more sustainable world. We've played our part by embedding sustainability across our teaching and learning for all of our students. We've shaped the global sustainability debate through our research done by our faculty. And we've worked to deepen public discussion on sustainability across the world through our public events program. And of course, we've worked to reduce the environmental impact of our own actions and becoming a net zero carbon university. Importantly, LSE drives sustainability results working in close collaboration with our students, with our academic and professional staff, and with external partners such as GAUC. I've been particularly struck at the dynamism of our students and how their thinking has evolved. For example, we now have two vegan cafes on campus, and that came from student activism, and they are among the most popular places to eat at LSE. We've also moved enormously in terms of how we think about using paper on campus. When I started, one of students' biggest demands was more credits to be able to print more paper. We've now moved to a position where our students are arguing for not having any printing credits and being able to rely much more on electronic means of documentation. And that's been a huge step. Only by working together in these ways can we, can we define a pathway to a more sustainable world. So do join us on this critical and exciting journey. We all have a part to play in shaping a more sustainable planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Shafiq, for her speech. And now let's welcome President of University of Cambridge, Mr. Stephen Tu. Please welcome. It is a great pleasure to speak with you at the opening ceremony of the Global Youth Summit of the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate. We are in the week before the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties. COP26 is a crucial moment in the global effort to address climate change. It promises to be a point where we move from ambition to action and young people are set to play a central role in this transition. There are over 1.8 billion people between the ages of 10 and 24. These are people who've grown up with the reality of climate change. They know that the decisions made now will have an impact on the rest of their lives. And they're mobilizing at an unprecedented scale 
to make their voices heard, putting forward new ideas and innovative solutions. It's our duty to them and to the world to support young people in becoming effective agents of change. The theme of this year's Youth Summit, Climate X, explores climate change not as a discrete threat, but as an issue that intersects with other major global challenges. The summit will seek to understand climate change through a whole systems lens, exploring the complex feedback mechanisms that happen in the space between issues. In Cambridge, we're already familiar with this approach. Recognizing how the extinction and climate crises are connected to social and ecological systems, the Cambridge Conservation Initiative and Cambridge Zero work together to explore how a whole systems perspective can lead to effective interventions on issues such as landscape restoration and nature-based solutions. I look forward to learning more about these interconnections in the week ahead. I'd like to finish by emphasizing the value of academic institutions coming together through networks such as GAUK and events such as the Global Youth Forum. Each of our institutions is at the center of extensive partnership networks, and it's through these networks that our expertise and knowledge is felt. By drawing these relationships close, Working in partnership with friends and colleagues from across the world, we can help address global challenges like climate change. The first and second Gauk graduate forums attracted nearly 400 postgraduates from more than 50 universities across six continents. I'm sure that this year's summit will extend this impact even further. My thanks to all of you. Have a successful summit. Thank you very much, Mr. Stoop, for his speech. And let's welcome our last speaker of the day, Ms. Mary Ryan, Vice Provost of Imperial College London. Please welcome. I'm Mary Ryan, and I'm the Vice Provost for Research and Enterprise at Imperial College London. And it's my pleasure to add my support and welcome to you at this Global Youth Summit. Nothing is more pressing than the climate emergency. and We must all work together to secure a sustainable and equitable future for all. At Imperial, we're working to bring together expertise and talent across the college through our Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment and our strategic initiative, the Transition to Zero Pollution. We realise that we need to address the whole system at a global scale, and we need to deliver education, research and innovation, translating discoveries into practice. We're proud to lead on the action track this week, which you'll hear more about later, and to foster innovation in our Environment Lab and the Centre for Climate Change Innovation. At Imperial, we want our students to leave with the freedom to imagine a better future, an obligation to question the status quo, and the skills to deliver lasting change. You, today, are leading the way, and this summit is part of that change. So, I wish you all a productive and enjoyable summit, and we all hope for renewed commitments and for real action arising from COP26. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ryan, for her speech. This year, our summit have created three tracks for students to take part in, academic, action, and voices. In the second part, respective universities will provide introduction followed by keynotes from pioneers in the field to share their insights. The academic track will come up first and introduced by student representative from Tsinghua University. Please welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Xie Chan Yang. I'm a master student from the School of Environment, Tsinghua University. The Global Youth Summit on the Net Zero Future will be held this week. The theme of the summit is Climate X, which put great emphasis on the synergy between climate change and other challenges to unlock the catalytic impact of climate actions on social, economic and environmental sustainable development. Inspired by hot topics in 2021, four subtopics related to climate change were selected. Nature, biodiversity, food and health, 
energy and transportation. The academic track seeks to provide scientific research insights for the global net zero transition from the perspective of youth. Research papers are collected from young scholars all over the world. Four member universities of GOG will host corresponding thematic forums during the summit. The University of Oxford on Climate X Nature Biodiversity, Columbia University on Climate X Energy, Yale University on Climate X Health, and Tsinghua University on Climate X Transport. After the opening of the academic track, the GOG Secretariat has received nearly 200 papers from young scholars across the globe who are dedicated to the climate change research. About 10 excellent papers will be selected and their authors will be invited to attend the awarding ceremony at COP26 in Glasgow together with the presidents from the member universities of GOG and other climate leaders. In addition, with the strong support from Elsevier and Springer, the world's leading publishing groups and our academic support partners, excellent papers will be potentially selected and published in the world-renowned academic journals. Our partners will also organize academic workshops to promote exchanges among young scholars. And we will also have the chance to directly communicate with the journal editors. One of the most inspiring highlights is that the summit encourages us, the young scholars, to explore the relationship between climate change and our professional fields and propose the synergistic solutions to addressing climate crisis and other sustainable development challenges. Of all submissions, nearly 80 papers specifically addressed the topic of the synergy between climate change and other sustainable development goals. Nine SDGs were discussed, including water resources, economic growth, industry transition, inequalities, justice, and other vital topics. Therefore, in addition to the four thematic forums, the fifth forum on Climate X SDGs will be hosted by Tsinghua University. I have also participated in the academic track and submitted my research paper that focused on exploring the optimal transition roadmap for China's iron and steel industry, which is related to SDG 9, Industrial Infrastructure. I'm happy that I have passed the preliminary review and I will have the opportunity to share my research findings at the Climate X SDGs Forum. The academic track is ready. Young people across the globe will infuse their enthusiasm into the irreversible momentum of net zero actions. Let us together look forward to the academic track series activities and please pay attention to the schedule of the Global Youth Summit on Net Zero Future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this introduction of the first track. And let's move on on our first keynote. 15 years ago, the release of the Stern Review, The Economics of Climate Change, has attracted widespread global attention to the issue of climate change. During its formation, Gauk was valued and supported by Lord Stern, the chair of Gauk Academic Committee. This year, Lord Stern not only contributes to the 15th anniversary of Stern Review as one of the series events of the summit, but inspires our member universities to contribute nine events. A nation has its own nationally determined contributions. A university has its own responsibility in addressing to climate change. So we contribute a brand new concept to the global climate governance, University Determined Contributions or UDCs. Let's welcome Lord Nicholas Stern, founding chair of the Grantham Research Institute from the London School of Economics and Political Science for our first keynote on the frontier of climate change. 
I'm very happy to be with you in this Global Youth Summit on a net zero future. Uh, I want to describe um, the urgency of action and the role of youth in promoting action as the first part of what I have to say. First, we have to recognize that we have two crises. We have the shorter term, I hope, shorter term crisis of COVID, which has been very severe for many countries, indeed all countries of the world. And we have the climate crisis. And I want to argue that we have to um, approach these two crises in a coordinated way. Particularly, we have to invest to recover from the shocks to the, to the economy associated with the COVID crisis. And we know that investment is at the heart, investment and innovation are at the heart of our response to the climate crisis. So we have to invest, and that's part of the story of responding to the two crises together. And we know that we all have to go to net zero if we are to um, manage our climate crisis. And we have to go to net zero by the middle of the century uh, for the world as a whole, if we are to be able to stabilize well below two degrees, ideally uh, around 1.5 degrees. So we have to tackle those two crises together in a spirit of cooperation and uh, through investment and innovation. And we have to recognize that the poorest countries in the world have been hit particularly hard by the COVID crisis and it will be the poorest countries of the world that will suffer most severely from the uh, climate crisis if we manage it badly. So that has to be the approach, cooperation, investment and innovation and recognition that the poorest countries will need the most support. So that is the basic approach. We must not make the mistake that we made after the First World War and the Spanish flu pandemic then, when much of the world tried to come out of that through a consumption boom, which eventually failed and led to the Great Depression. We mustn't make the mistake that much of the world made coming out of the global financial crisis of 12 or so years ago, where in many countries we had premature austerity, which choked off investment and suppressed growth. We must make neither of those mistakes. We must plan now for strong investment and particularly in supporting investment in the poorer countries of the world. So that's the challenge. Now, what's the role of youth in that challenge? Well, if you think about uh, how we can and what's running in our favor in responding to that challenge, we do have a world where uh, investment has been lower as a fraction of GDP in most countries of the world um, over this last 10 years or so compared with 20 years or so ago. We have a deficiency of investment. We have a lack of demand in the world economy and we can and should increase that investment. And interest rates are still because of that deficiency of investment relative to saving at a historical low. Also, into our advantage, we have very rapid technical progress and falling costs in many key technologies. We do have international agreements, the Paris Agreement, and we hope we'll have a Glasgow Agreement fairly soon. We have the world's sustainable development goals, like the Paris Agreement from 2015. So there is a foundation in international agreement, even though we've seen some difficulty and fractiousness around uh, international relations in the last few years. But most importantly, we have the strengths of young people. The young people in this uh, graduate forum, the young people that have been associated with the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate, the young people that we see in the universities as teachers, where we see them every day. So young people, should be demanding action and uh, strongly demanding action because it's their future and they understand the issues and the immense risks from climate change. But, they, but more than that, young people can be 
the shapers of action through their understanding, through their research, through their scholarship, whichever discipline they come from, whether it's from politics to pure science and technology, right across the board, economics is my own discipline, but right across the board, young people can bring their skills and young people can choose where to work. So there's so much that young people can do in a very active way, in a very constructive way. So let me turn to the second part of what I want to say, which is to see action on climate as integrated into environment, biodiversity, and the way we live more generally. Uh, the world has lost so much of its natural capital. It faces so many important loss of species, extinction of species. Um, we rely enormously on our natural capital our trees and our forests, our grasslands, the way we manage our uh, agriculture, our rivers, our oceans. There's so much there in our biodiversity that's extremely important for the way we live. And those natural systems are absolutely vital to the way in which we live. They're our natural infrastructure. They shape what we can do in the way that physical infrastructure shapes what we can do. So climate and biodiversity and the environment more generally are woven together. Uh, will we have cities where we can move and breathe? Will we have ecosystems which are robust and fruitful? That depends on what we do on climate, but it also depends on what we do directly in looking after and investing in protecting our natural capital and our natural infrastructure. So that is a very important part of the story and it's critical to see that as closely integrated. Of course, a hostile climate destroys nature, but we destroy nature in other ways, through overexploitation, through poisoning of our natural uh, environment, and, uh, and so on. So we have to look at that as a whole. And of course, investing in natural capital uh, does give us negative emissions. And if we're going to net zero, we really do need those uh, negative emissions. But of course, we shouldn't see natural capital only about negative emissions. It is about negative emissions, but it's about so much more. So those strands of integration across climate, biodiversity, natural capital are extremely important. Let me turn to my third topic, which is the relationship between climate and the economy. First, of course, hostile climate, devastating climate will be very damaging for our economy. And I think at least in economics, we have not built into our models, the integrated assessment models, the extent of the damage, the risks that we face from unmanaged climate change. It could be absolutely devastating. We could be leaving the future with far lower standards of living than now. We could be risking the deaths of hundreds of millions or billions of people through unmanaged climate change. And I think that level of risk is not there yet in our economic models. I think in our economic models, we don't yet have some of the risk management that will be necessary and the transition management, which will be necessary as we very quickly change our systems and ways of doing things. Investing in the new ways of doing things is enormously attractive, but it involves big change. It involves big change in the systems of cities, uh, land, energy, transportation, the way we do manufacturing and other things. It involves very big change, and that will be involve change in prices, change in the valuation of firms, and most importantly, change in the jobs that people do. So again, in our economics, we need to focus much more on the management of change, and in particular, on the challenges of a just transition, so that those who are dislocated through this change in their work or in other ways are able to um, uh, find new ways of doing things, new activities, and they receive some protection. But let me uh, close on the economics on a more optimistic tone. Um, Moving fast to net zero 
as we do that, protecting our biodiversity and our environment. This is the way we increase living standards. This is the development story, the growth story of the 21st century. It's full of discovery, innovation, investment, lower cost ways of doing things, um, doing things in very different ways through the management of our systems, whether it's land or cities, energy or transport. Very exciting new opportunities, many of them already, including in electricity, at lower cost than the old dirty measures that went before. But they bring so much more with them. As I've emphasized, cities where we can move and breathe, ecosystems which are robust and fruitful, much healthier ways of moving around, exercising, eating, and so on. This is a very attractive development story, but it does need investment. It needs strong investment. It needs, in most countries of the world, an increase in investment of two or three percentage points of GDP, but very powerful returns to that investment, way beyond the fundamental one of reducing the risk of climate change. So this is a very positive story, but we have to invest in a very purposive way. We have to manage systemic change. We need a very thorough systems approach to the economy as a whole and to the individual systems that I've described. But all this is in our hands if we do it well, and it will be the young people of the world which will drive not only the energy in doing this, but in large measure, be very much involved, must be involved in how we do this. I'll be giving a lecture at the London School of Economics on October the 26th, but what I'll be talking about is 15 years on from the Stern Review. I'll be emphasizing that the science is much more worrying even than we saw 15 years ago when we were very worried, that technology has changed enormously, that we have new ways of managing systems, particularly digitally, which have advanced enormously rapidly. We have a private sector, which has now woken up in large measure. We have countries around the world committed to net zero. So we have a building momentum, but, and it's a very big but, we're not moving anywhere near fast enough. So we hope that the young people of the world will push us along. We rely on you to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Stern, for his keynote. The second track introduced by student representative from Imperial College London is focused on the action track and how to come up with solutions on climate change issues. Good afternoon. My name is Elisa Gilbert. I'm the Director of Policy and Translation at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment at Imperial College London. And I'm delighted to tell you about the action track under the Gauk Climate Summit. The action track is a chance for the students of the Gauk universities to get excited and engaged in making solutions to the climate change challenge that we have. What we've done is we've gathered together a number of students from many of our participating universities and asked them to participate in a mini hackathon. This is the opportunity for them to take a challenge like climate change and try and come up with a solution that they can then make into a viable and real business idea that can either make money or become a social enterprise or a not-for-profit. What we've done is try to connect our students to each other around the world so that they're participating in this activity in small teams, meeting people that they've never met before from a different context and a different part of the world. This is because we recognize that the solutions to climate change have to be relevant to the context and also applicable in all different parts of the world. We know that our students have the passion and the energy to try and find solutions to tackle climate change. And we want them to think about doing this in a different way. This is the way of kind of making a business that they can then think about expanding perhaps in the future. In our hackathon track, we're giving the students a challenge and that's to follow up with our climate X theme. So how does climate relate to issues like nature and biodiversity protection? How does nature um, how does climate interact with our health? What are the solutions to climate change that we can find at these junctures or these combinations of issues? So, for example, are there solutions to climate change that bring health benefits? Or how about thinking about adaptation to climate change solutions that also tackle other issues we have about the quality of our built environment or how people in poorer environments find their uh, living conditions? So there's lots and lots of opportunities at these intersections. We've set a series of challenges 
and questions that the students can use as jumping off points to create their ideas and their businesses. And we're giving them a week of fun activities this week while they're here from business mentors to help inspire them to understand how the for-profit and not-for-profit business sector can help multiply a solution, amplify it, and allow it to spread in a rapid and different way than other complementary policy solutions might. We're taking those students through a process this week, and what we hope is that at the end of the week, we'll have a series of fantastic videos where these student teams present to us their solutions. We're going to be choosing a winner. We've, we've established a really great panel of people to assess those assess those uh, videos and those solutions. And the final one will be presented at the Gauk Summit at the end of the week, uh, the first week of COP on November the 5th. We hope that you'll also take a look and share these videos of solutions yourselves. They'll be accessible on social media. We're gonna follow up our initial hackathon where hopefully we've primed these students and taught them some skills about building new business ideas that can solve climate change. We're gonna build on that. And in July next year, also together with Tsinghua and several of the other Gauk universities, we'll be holding a further, more in-depth hackathon that will allow students and young people to build their ideas that are at this very initial nascent stage through to something bigger and more established. Please, of course, uh, let us know if you want to get involved and find this idea exciting. And we look forward to sharing with you our solutions videos as presented by our students uh, at the end of the week the first week of COP, so November 5th. Thank you for listening and to our students, thank you so much for showing your interest and for participating in this initiative. The Summit Voice Tracks invites young people from 16 to 30 years old to share their climate stories, share their youth climate pledge, and offer advice to leaders. The voice of the young people are honest and genuine. Now, Let's enjoy the Act Now film trailer for the trailer of the voice track. Please enjoy. The impacts of climate change are all around us. They're easy to see. And that is why we need to act now. It's not just an issue for a specific group of people or specific region. Because it affects every aspect of food, clothing, shelter and transportation. I foresee that climate change will lead to widespread poverty and food insecurity in my country. A directly climate-related typhoon hit my homeland Macau, causing 10 deaths around my neighborhood. In recent years, the climate change brings enormous damage to our home, family, and friends. We passed Tokyo. We're at a tipping point. We're at a place of no return. We are ravaging the very ecosystem that underpin our society. I'm calling on decision makers to make space, to listen, include, and be accountable to our demands and ideas. We've got a vanishingly thin opportunity of time with which we can act. So please listen. Please seize this opportunity to rebuild our planet. We need a revolution of food system. Without combating climate change, we can't look into the future with any hope. The solution is in your hands. We must act now. Hello, I'm Amy Thompson and I'm Head of Policy Programmes and Communications at the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath. I'm part of the project management team for the ACT NOW film. ACT NOW film is a Youth Voices project that has been produced by students. It's sponsored by the COP26 Universities Network and has been project managed by Cambridge Zero and the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath and run in partnership with GAUK. We are delighted that the Act Now film is part of the Climate X Conference Youth Voices track. We will now hear from two of the students who have been involved in the making of Act Now film, and I am delighted to introduce Cassie and then Jen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Act Now film, a project amplifying youth voices for climate action. We invited young people from around the world to tell us about their experiences and the actions that they wanted to see from the leaders that represent them. The response was overwhelming. In just over three months, we had nearly 140 submissions from over 33 countries. Their issues were great and they were many, but they all need to be heard. We are a group of young volunteers who have worked behind the scenes to spread the word about the film and get submissions from young people invested in climate. We have picked key messages and stories from each individual and learnt how they are affected by climate change. 
We have then combined elements from each film to create the whole Act Now film. Everyone has worked on a different element of the film. For example, I have composed music to accompany the film. Today we will just be showing a short clip, but you can see the full film debuting here at the Galk Climate X conference tomorrow on Tuesday 26th of October at 2pm. Before listening to the third keynote, I would like to take a few minutes and introduce you to our last speaker. From 2010 to 2016, Ms. Christiana Figueres served as the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. With a background in anthropology, she managed to bring the country's parties back to the negotiating table, resulting in the making of the Paris Agreement in 2015. Figueres now hosts the well-known podcast Outrage Plus Optimism. She published her best-selling book, The Future We Choose, last year to answer the question, what can I do to achieve carbon neutrality? Active at the forefront of the global climate governance, Figueres listens to and integrates the voices of the world and at the same time constantly using her own voice to call for the efforts of the world. We are very honored to receive Ms. Figueres today to our last keynote, so please, let's welcome her. Hello friends, I am Cristiana Figueres, and I was born in the Holocene period, the geological era prior to the one you were born into. It was a 12,000 year long era of planetary stability. Being born in the Holocene does not mean I'm a dinosaur. But during the Holocene, humans did discover how to use dinosaur and plant remains buried deep in the earth to produce energy. They burned these old fossils for heat and power without knowing their negative impact. We have to be grateful to the fossil fuels that powered the rapid economic development we saw in some parts of the world since the Industrial Revolution. But today, we know that this economic growth was concentrated in a few countries and had dangerous cumulative effects for all countries. Today, we also know that local pollution from burning fossil fuels causes chronic diseases like asthma, cancer, and even dementia, and that it permanently stunts children's hearts, lungs, and brains, causing damage for life. You were all born in the Anthropocene era, the geological epoch that started in the 1950s and marks the abrupt change from a world where humans were the thriving recipients of a stable, favorable environment to a world where humans became the direct cause of transformations in our natural environment, and not for the better. In just 70 short years, ignoring all the scientific warnings we were given about the dangers that would ensue, humans have substantially altered Earth's atmosphere, land, and oceans in so many ways that we are literally living ourselves out of our life providing environment. This is the most perilous moment in human history. We risk becoming fossils ourselves very quickly. We are at code red for humanity. Radical changes in the life supporting earth systems that have up until now been keeping us safe. These radical changes which are causing us to reach dangerous tipping points in our global climate system, have been confirmed categorically by the latest scientific report on climate change. Our planet will, of course, continue her evolutionary path, started 4.5 billion years ago. But the knock-on effects, should we cross those tipping points, would render many parts of our globe uninhabitable to the human race. That would bring economic, social, health, political, and even 
international security consequences, such as none of us have ever experienced before, nor would we ever want to. The long-term benefits of this remarkable transition, jobs, clean air, livable cities, as well as the possibility to limit the worst of future climate impacts, will only be available to the world if all countries work to decarbonize their economies on time. That's because our atmosphere, our climate, and our weather patterns are not bound by national borders or governed by nation states. In order to succeed, we have to work together to cut current global emissions in half by 2030 over the next nine years. And then we have to reduce them by half again by 2040 and half again by 2050 while actively restoring nature until we get to net zero emissions by 2050. This is the only path that allows us to pursue economic growth and shared health and prosperity for all. Friends, you are the beginning of the Anthropocene era. You are the ancestors of everyone who will live in that period. Today, you are writing the future history of human presence on this planet. Let's begin the countdown and welcome the start of the 2021 Global Youth Summit. Our opening ceremony marks the beginning of our five-day 2021 Global Youth Summit. I would like to wish good luck to everyone participating and get creative on this chance to preserve the climate. The world is looking at us for fresh ideas, innovative solutions and surprising observations. We can play a part in saving the planet.